We're working on chapter 5 here, section 5.5. We talked about naming some binary ionic compounds, and we're going to talk about some polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions are uh, ions that have more than one atom in them. Poly means many. Atomic refers to atoms. Polyatomic ions. So these are things that are charged. So some of them might look like a compound, you know, ClO3. We're like, well, that would be a compound if it has no charge. If it has a charge, it's an ion. And they have several atoms bound, bound together. These guys have special names, and you just have to memorize them. Okay, that's the only way to, to know them. There's no real pattern or system that I can give you, like off the periodic table or anything. The good news is that I am going to um, give you the table of, uh, well, I haven't decided exactly what I'm going to do. I'm either going to give you that table of polyatomic ions or I'm going to let you have the 3 by 5 card and let you write them down yourself and bring them for the next exam. Okay, so I recommend memorizing them, but I'm not going to require that for Chem 10. So if you have to go on take 3A or 1A, you know, maybe start memorizing those because you will have to for those classes. But this one, you're off the hook. So these are the polyatomic ions. The ones with stars are the most important. Um, most important because we see them most frequently. So let's look at these really quick. There is, um, where's my pointer? Ammonium is the only positive polyatomic ion. Okay, and so we're going to run into him occasionally. Um, here these two guys are very similar, aren't they? NO, this one has two oxygens, this has three, they both have a minus one charge. Their names are very similar also. Okay, so we have to pay attention to details here. One letter different and one number different. So there's a bunch of those like that. A lot of these end in eight or eight. There's only a couple that end in IDE. We learned that the monatomic um, anions like chloride, fluoride, bromide, oxide, those guys all end in ide. So these are two that might possibly be a little confusing. These are kind of weird ones. OH minus, very common, that's hydroxide. And cyanide is CN minus. Um, but all the others end in TE, either A-T-E or I-T-E. Somebody's very excited out on the green there. So if you, oh, I guess here's one more that ends in D, peroxide. But most of these that are in the table have a T in them, if that helps you. So oxyanions, most of these are oxyanions. These are polyatomic anions, and they have oxygen in them. And there's a pattern here in these names. So this is the one, let's see, maybe a highlighter would be good there. The 8 is the one that you memorize or you write down, and then we can figure out the rest of these from this pattern that they make. So if someone has extra energy, we say they are hyper, right? Okay, so here's chlorate ion. This is per chlorate, per like in hyper. The per whatever, eight, we could have perchlorate or per bromate that has extra oxygen, just like a child who's a hyperactive has extra activity, extra energy. Here, if we go one less oxygen, and the, the difference here, they all have one chlorine, they all have one negative charge. It's extra big there so you can see it. Um, but the only difference is the number of oxygens, four, three, two, and one. So this one right under it with one less oxygen is the light version. Bud Light has a third fewer calories than regular Bud, right? Chlorite has one less oxygen than chlorate. It's the light version, okay? And then hypo is below light. The prefix hypo means below or less than. So hypodermic, you associate that with needles, right? 
Hypodermic needle, where does it go? It goes below your skin. Your skin is called your dermis. Hypodermic, below your skin. So hypo means less than. Hypochlorite has one less oxygen than chlorite does. You see the pattern there? Well, it's there even if you don't see it. <laughs> yeah, I'm in a mood today, sorry. So when we name compounds that contain these polyatomic ions, the rules are really similar to the rules we learned for the binary compounds. Um, so examples here are ammonium acetate. Ammonium is the name of the first ion, and acetate is the name of the second ion. Now both of those, you're like, uh, those, aren't, those aren't elements in the periodic table. No, they're not. The, both of those are found in the table of polyatomic ions. And so the first one is ammonium ion, and here is its formula with its charge. And here is acetate, C2H3O2 with a minus one charge. And like we learned earlier, if we have plus one charge and minus one charge, we just need one of each of these ions, and so you just squish them together, and you have the formula for the compound. And in the compound's formula, we don't write the charges. There are no charges in the compound formula. Because acetate has a minus one charge. It's a polyatomic ion. So let's go back to that table real quick and look at it. Okay, so acetate is over here. C2H3O2 minus. These are all ions, they're going to have charges. Now, this is an especially complicated one because if you look at that, NHCHO, there's, there are f one, two, three, four different elements, but the hydrogens are listed separately, and it just looks like there's an awful lot of elements there, right? And if you look at that and you ask yourself, well, is the first element a metal, you would say, no, it's not. And so then you might think that this is not an ionic compound. A compound starting with this NH4 is the exception to the, the little rule that ionic compounds contain a metal. If it starts with NH4, it is also an ionic compound. Any ionic compound is broken into two ions. So we're not going to break this into nitrogen, you know, we're not going to call this nitrogen tetrahydride dicarbon trihydride dioxide or something like that. People, you know, get very creative with their names and that's all very nice, but, you know, save that for naming your children and you can pay for their psychological care later. <laughs> so let's look at some examples. NaOH, how do we name this? Well, we see that there's, there's three elements here, okay? We're going to look at the first element always and ask ourselves, is that a metal? Find it on the periodic table. Yes, that's a metal. So that's our first ion, and the second ion is everything else. So let's even just draw a line here and divide that so that we don't get confused. Come on. So we'll draw, draw a line here, okay? So we have the Na is one thing and the OH is the other thing. So let's name that first one. Na is sodium. And does sodium need a Roman numeral? It's in group one. No, it doesn't need a Roman numeral. And then OH, well, that's a polyatomic ion. We go and we look in the table for that. Some of you have the table in front of you. What's the name of it? Hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide. Okay. Any questions about that one? Well, what's, what's the charge on the hydroxide? Negative. Negative one. 
right? So this is OH minus, and what's the charge on sodium ion? Plus one. Plus one. Mm. Would you have to switch those? Like, um, because it's still a plus one. You don't do anything with the bottom. The no. Okay. No. So that's sodium hydroxide. Let's do this one. Again, we're looking at that first element. It's magnesium. It's a metal. Okay, this is ionic. The metal's going to be by itself. So here's the, we've got the magnesium, and then we've got everything else. Most of these compounds have two names, a first name and a last name. Some of them have a middle name that they use, but um, it's usually hydrogen. So Mg is what element? Magnesium. magnesium. Does magnesium need a Roman numeral? No, it doesn't, because it's in group two. And then we find NO3 on the table of polyatomic ions. And what's its name? Nitrate. So that's magnesium nitrate. Well, there are, there are two nitrate ions in there, right? But we don't have to worry about that when we're writing the name because we don't have to figure out what the Roman numeral is because this one doesn't need one. Um, the, this is composed of magnesium ion, which has a 2 plus charge, and nitrate ion, which has a minus 1 charge. And that's why there's two nitrate ions in there with the parentheses in the subscript 2 because we need two of these guys to balance the charge. You only write prefixes when the charge equals zero? When it does, when it equals zero? Um, we're, the prefixes di, tri, tetra are for nonmetals only, okay. for things that don't have charges. Okay. Okay. And I don't think we've talked about those yet, have we? I get confused. Yeah. We did? Okay. Okay. So the, those prefixes are used when you have two nonmetals, because there's no other way to tell how many nitrogens react with how many oxygens. Because you can't look at the charges and figure it out. Ionic compounds, we don't need that because the charges tell us. So if we had the name magnesium nitrate, we can write the magnesium ion with its charge, and we can write the nitrate ion with its charge and figure out that we need two nitrates. Okay, and when you're first learning how to do that, it seems like this you know, just writing the formulas is a big deal and a lot of thinking and figuring out. Once you really get it ingrained in your head, it requires very little thought, okay? And so, you know, that's just how we do it. So here's a note that shows up over here. When we have more than one polyatomic ion, then we put parentheses around it and we put the number, the subscript on the outside, and that's talking about this guy right here. So these polyatomic ions are like a bundle pack at Costco. You know, you buy the Wii and it comes with two extra controllers and two games or something. And you can't just buy the Wii. You have to buy it with all these other things. And so the NO3, the nitrogen, comes with three oxygens. And you can't buy them separately. And this, the parentheses here are, t are like the shrink wrap. It's holding those together. And this is how many of those packages we have. Okay. So in this compound, how many oxygens are in that formula unit? There's six, because in each of those NO3s, there's three, and the parentheses with the two tells us there's two of those packages in there. I think there's another example here. Here's another one. So we look at this guy, and we always look at the first element. And nitrogen is not a metal. So, but then if we're going to use the binary molecular, the binary covalent, the prefixes, we can only have two nonmetals, right? This has four nonmetals, so that's not going to work, is it? 
So then hopefully we'll see, oh, wait a minute, there's that NH4 guy. This is ionic. So this is ionic, and we've got NH4 and SO4. It always breaks into pieces, okay? Traditional marriage is one man, one woman, right? We're not talking about Utah in the olden days of polygamy or anything. There's two ions. There's one positive and one negative, okay? So you can't break it up into three ions. You can't have two positives and one negative. It's just, it's two ions. So we name the first one first, NH4. It's a polyatomic ion. You maybe need to look it up. Ammonium. Ammonia is NH3, and that's a compound. Ammonium is the ion. It's NH4+. Plus. And then what's the name of SO4? Sulfate. So that's ammonium sulfate. Any questions? Yeah. If we look at the if we look at their um, ion formulas, we've got NH4 plus and SO4 two minus. And that's why in the formula for the compound there's two ammonium ions and one sulfate. NH4 two. Any questions? Because to get these charges to balance out. We do the crisscross thing. Then we've got a subscript of two for the ammonium and a subscript of one for the uh, sulfate, and that's what we end up with over here oh, with NH42. We need to put parentheses around that. If we left off the parentheses, it might look like NH42. And that's not what we mean. Who needs a Wii and 42 controllers? Maybe 42 games. That would be good. Ammonium sulfate. There's another one. FIPO. So, first element. It's a metal. It's ionic, right? Name is iron. Does iron need a Roman numeral? Yeah, it does. So I'm going to put the parentheses there. I'm going to try to put parentheses there. And leave a space. And PO4, what's, what's the name of that? Phosphate. How do we figure out what the Roman numeral is? We have to look at the charge on phosphate. Phosphate is PO4, 3 minus. And then we've got Fe, and we don't know what its charge is. Well, we've got one phosphate ion and one iron ion. So the iron must be 3 plus. Okay. We're going to be doing a worksheet about this on Friday during lecture. So that's hopefully going to help. So iron 3 phosphate. So here's a flow chart, overall strategy naming chemical compounds. First ask yourself, is this a binary compound? And if yes, then go use the strategy in the previous flowchart. This is like a tax form. Um, if it's binary, look at the first element. If it's a metal, you use those, you know, things. And if it's not, then you can use the prefixes. So if, if it's not a binary compound, if there's more than two elements in it, then ask yourself, is there polyatomic ions in it? There might be two, like with ammonium sulfate. If yes, then we're going to name the name it with those procedures similar to the ionic compounds with that only have two. This is not the flow chart I would draw, but... Okay, so if there's no polyatomic ion, then this is a compound that we haven't learned how to do yet. Okay? That's a goofy flow chart. Exercise.
like how the sun flashes. I didn't do that. So what's the name of this? KClO3. Well, let's look at the first element. Is it a metal? Yeah. So separate those two. We've got K, which is potassium. Does potassium need a Roman numeral? No. It's in group one. Remember, if it's in group one, two, or three, we don't need a Roman numeral. ClO3, what's that? Chlorate. Okay, there's no figuring that out from the periodic table. That's just something that has to be memorized. Any questions? The, the potassium ion has a plus one charge. This, the chloride ion has a minus one charge, and that's why the formula is KClO3. So this was multiple choice, but we figured it out. So potassium chlorate, it's letter B. And the exam on this will be multiple choice as well. And so, you know, there's strategies for making the most of a multiple choice exam. Here, you know, they, they all have potassium listed. And so we, we, we don't have to even really worry about what its name is or whether it needs a Roman numeral because we're not given any of those options. So then here what we're focusing is on is what's the name of the anion over there. And hopefully you could rule out the carbonate because there's no carbon in that compound. And so now you've got it down to a 1 in 3 chance, just by guessing. But it's chlorate. Um, examine the following table of formulas. Well, let's look at the table. And uh, which of these are named correctly? These are the sorts of of multiple choice questions that I think are just nasty. You know, one and two, one, three, and four, one and four, one only. Uh, this is, I won't do that to you on an exam. But how do you solve a problem like this? Well, ignore all those choices at first and just look at the table and figure out which ones are correct. And then after you figure that out, you can go over and, and choose the correct choice. So let's look at these guys. P2O5, they're calling that diphosphorus pentoxide. Is this an ionic compound? Is phosphorus a metal? No, phosphorus isn't a metal. So we have phosphorus and oxygen, two nonmetals, and so that means we can use the prefixes. So they use the prefixes there. They've got the second element ending in ide, and that's correct. And penta is for five and di is for two, so that one looks correct. So that one's correct. How about the next one? Chlorine oxide, is that correct? No, what's, what's missing? Di. That needs to be chlorine dioxide. Because if I told you to write the formula for chlorine oxide, how would you know that there's two oxygens? Both of those are nonmetals. You don't have charges to tell you. We use the prefixes when we don't have charges to tell us. So that one is wrong. How about PBI4? They're giving it the name lead iodide. Is that correct? No. What's it missing? Is it missing a prefix? Well, can we use prefixes? We have to look at the first element, metal or nonmetal. Is lead a metal? It's a, it's a metal. So we would like to use tetra, but we can't use tetra. They need a Roman numeral. Because lead is not in group one, two, or three. We don't know what its charge is. Sometimes it makes a plus two, and sometimes it makes a plus four. But you can't tell that from the periodic table which one it is. So that one's not right because it's missing its uh, Roman numeral. It should be lead four iodide because the iodides each have a minus one charge and there's four of them. There's only one lead and so that would need a plus four charge. CuSO4 is that copper one sulfate. 
Well, copper's a metal, and so it's being named as an ionic compound. Copper needs a Roman numeral. Is the Roman numeral correct? No, it's not. Sulfate is SO4 2 minus. There's one sulfate and one copper. The copper needs to have a plus 2 charge to be balanced with the SO4. So that one's wrong. So it should be copper 2 sulfate. So this should be copper 2 sulfate. Well, that's that's close enough. No, no it isn't actually. Sulfate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this this lead one. Well, let's see where should I write? I'll put him up here. That should be lead four iodide. And the one above that should be chlorine dioxide. Personally, I think it's more difficult to be given the formula and the name and asked if it's correct than it is to just be given one and asked to find the other. Because they, they throw stuff in and you're like, oh, yeah, that looks good. So sometimes on those multiple choice, you know, here's, here's a formula, what's the name? It might be a good idea to not look at the names. Just figure out what you think the correct name is and then pick that one out and not get distracted by all these other different options. As a prefix or a yeah. Or not. Yeah. Because <laughs> sometimes when you look at all these options and you're like, oh, wait, that, that one looks pretty good too. It's kind of like with, uh, with some of my children. Michael was my squirreliest one. I know Andrew's, you know, I talk about Andrew because he's young currently, but... When Michael was little, I mean, he just did all kinds of things. And, you know, you can't, you can't really anticipate all the things he's going to do. And you also don't want to give him any ideas, right? Because maybe he hadn't thought of that one crazy thing. And, and you don't want to put any ideas into his head. And so sometimes with these multiple choice things, we're putting wrong ideas into your head, and that might make it more confusing. So feel free to just not look at those until after you decide what the right answer is. Any questions about that one?